My name is Eric Rush, and I am a, a clinical geneticist at uh, the University of Nebraska Medical Center and at Children's Hospital and Medical Center. Today I'm talking about the diagnosis and management of a neurofibromatosis type 1. Uh, this is a relatively common disorder in my practice and, and a relatively common disorder in general pediatrics practice, practices. Our objectives today are to describe the clinical diagnosis of NF1 as well as discussing situations where it would be appropriate to do genetic testing and to promote high quality primary care for children and adolescents with NF1 as well as to give providers the tools to give anticipatory guidance to families and patients who are affected by NF1. The diagnosis of NF1 really relies on recognition of a handful of cardinal features. Uh, in particular, a patient or a person with NF1 must have two of the following criteria. Six or more cafe au lait spots, which are by and large regularly shaped uh, and frequently are scattered throughout the, the limbs in the trunk. Uh, axillary and inguinal freckling, uh, which can look much like very smaller manifestations of cafe au lait spots. Neurofibromas, which may not happen until at the time or after puberty sphenoid malformations or pseudoarthroses, uh, particularly in the tibia, uh, Lisch nodules, which are, uh, which are typically only visible uh, with, a, uh, with a good ophthalmologic exam, as well as optic glioma. For patients with a family history, they only require one of the clinical manifestations of, uh, of NF1 because having a first-degree relative is itself an important diagnostic criteria for the, uh, for the, uh, the diagnosis of this condition. And just as an aside, for, uh, for those of you who are evaluating patients uh, who are infants uh, that are at risk, particularly those who are at 50% risk for NF1, they may not have the, uh, the, all the cardinal characteristics right up front. And it's very common for an infant only to have a handful of cafe au lait spots. Although 90% of patients with, uh, with a documented NF1 mutation will meet the clinical criteria by about age 8. Some of the more soft clinical features that are not part of the official criteria, but I also associate with neurofibromatosis, include patients with, uh, with macrocephaly. Most commonly, it will be relatively macrocephalic as opposed to absolutely macrocephalic. And then there's also a, a, a fairly strong association with learning disabilities, but not usually true intellectual, intellectual disability. Most patients with NF1 that I treat uh, will require a little extra help in school, uh, but by and large have normal overall intelligence. Uh, and for reasons that we don't quite understand, the, there is a tendency to have poor social success compared to peers without NF1. And this slide just gives you a little bit of a framework for what sort of cafe au lait spots we would be looking for. On the left are very typical neurofib uh, or excuse me cafe au lait spots uh, for a patient with neurofibromatosis, whereas on the right uh, uh, is a very large cafe au lait spot that I would associate with a different condition called McCune Albright syndrome. Uh, these are very large uh, and segmental and also very irregular. Uh, cafe au lait spots that we see associated with McCune Albright, whereas the uh, the, the uh, cafe au lait spots associated with neurofibromatosis uh, tend to be fairly regular. And the neurofibromas themselves uh, are uh, are lesions that uh, frequently will will manifest in clusters, but can also be isolated on the skin, uh, and. Again, in most cases, you'll see these neurofibromas start popping up at or after the time of puberty, although it's not unheard of for children to also have the onset of neurofibromas. Uh, we frequently get asked in the genetics clinic about the need to do genetic testing for patients with uh, neurofibromatosis. And I would say, as a general rule, if you're able to make a clinical diagnosis, there generally is not a need to perform genetic testing. I generally reserve uh, uh, testing for patients in which the results of the testing will impact the medical management. And that's true for neurofibromatosis as well as for most other disorders. The most common reason I, that I run into uh, the reason to do testing is for patients who have either symptomatic optic gliomas or another central nervous system tumor, because in that case, knowing about uh, a germline mutation in the NF1 gene will change management to some degree.
uh, infants and toddlers who are suspected of having NF1 but are clinically well uh, and have clinical tests, may have clinical testing to decide whether NF1 surveillance is needed because they may not yet meet criteria. Um, but it's also permissible to just follow those patients clinically and not do genetic testing. Uh, sometimes there is a, a little bit of a diagnostic quandary in patients who only have skin findings of, uh, uh, of cafe au lait spots, and they may instead have a, a similar syndrome called Legia syndrome, not true NF1. And this syndrome is caused by a mutation in, in a different gene called SPREAD1. However, very young patients uh, often have not mani completely manifested their eventual symptoms, and so as a result, uh, it may not be possible to tell clinically between a SPREAD1 mutation and an NF1 mutation in a, uh, a very young child. Uh, now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the management of uh, patients with uh, neurofibromatosis. And the management starts in infancy. Uh, in infants that I see with neurofibromatosis, uh, typically a lot of the discussion uh, is around the phenotype of NF1, what it means for the child. Uh, both for the short term and for the long term, and typically this is of course occurring with the family, and uh, and in, in very many cases the, uh, there are other family members that are also affected, and other family members which may also be affected, and how that uh, the uh, description of the disease may differ for different family members. I also do a skin examination at every visit, uh, and I reassure the family that increases in cafe au lait over time are expected and are not of any major concern are simply a manifestation of the disease. For the infants, the, really the most important aspect of their neurofibromatosis specific care is, is following their growth and development closely uh, and just knowing that they may have a slightly slower body, uh, a slightly smaller body size with slightly s slower development and a larger head that is common. And then also you should watch for focal neurologic signs as these can be a sign of CNS tumor uh, and sometimes can be a manifestation of vision loss from an optic glioma as well. Uh, and I also encourage blood pressure monitoring from a very early age because hypertension is exceedingly common in patients with NF1. And as far as anticipatory guidance, I also always uh, encourage the pediatricians and other practitioners caring for patients to make families aware of NF1 support groups right away. Uh, many families find this to be very useful for their, uh, for their children with NF1. The management in childhood is also quite similar as the management of infancy in that we continue to monitor the growth and development uh, and we also have a very low threshold for these patients for referral into early intervention programs. We continue to monitor blood pressure and, and we continue with yearly ophthalmology examinations, again looking for optic gliomas. Some providers uh, who are familiar with NF1 will recommend brain MRIs at uh, between the ages of 2 and 5. Uh, to assess for unidentified bright objects, which are, are T2-weighted uh, uh, hyperintensities uh, that probably are the result of uh, differences in myelination uh, between patients with NF1 and patients without. Uh, at this point, the consensus does not support the practice uh, as there is uh, often no clear management differences, and so I do not image the brain if the patient is asymptomatic. However, if the patient is not asymptomatic and there are focal neurologic deficits or major concerns over development or new onset of seizures, it is, it is of course perfectly reasonable to do an MRI of the patient's brain. For social management in patients who, are true, who have uh, childhood NF1, uh, they likely are becoming aware of some small and subtle differences between them and other children and counseling may be needed for this. And then know that there is an increased risk of poor social success with NF1 in, uh, and in some cases, uh, specific behavioral programs uh, which are centered on improving social su success can actually be a benefit in these children. Management in adolescence uh, centers around a lot of the same issues but also monitoring pu pubertal development as puberty can be early in patients with NF1. Uh, continuing to monitor blood pressure is important as it's not uncommon for patients who are adolescent with NF1 to start to develop hypertension. Ophthalmology examinations can be extended out to every two years if patients have had previously normal or unconcerning examinations. Uh, and it should, be, uh, it should be communicated to the patients that they are more likely to develop cutaneous and plexiform neurofibromas at and after the time of puberty. And I encourage providers to have a very frank discussion uh, with the, uh, about the diagnosis of NF1, and I tend to integrate this talk into discussion of sexuality and reproduction uh, with the adolescent patient.
I, I want to share a word on mortality for patients with NF1. And the reason I'm doing this is because it invariably comes up in conversation uh, with the our parents having uh, unlimited access to internet resources uh, and all the good and bad that can come from that. And I would say that the mortality for patients with NF1 is higher than the general population. Uh, there have been two high quality studies that have looked at mortality in NF1. One study done in Italy looked at the years 1995 to 2006 and found that there was a decreased life expectancy uh, and the life average was in the mid 50s. And the excess life expectancy appeared to be uh, due to malignancy, particularly of the connective tissue, soft tissue, and brain tumors. And there was also an excess of, of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease as well, for reasons that are not clear. An American study looked at the years 1983 to 1997 and found a similar median age, uh, median life expectancy of 59 years, and a similar excess of malignancy particularly in, in younger patients who passed away of, uh, of uh, cerebrovascular, or excuse me, of, uh, of uh, CNS malignancy. Uh, the incidence of um, cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease was also uh, a bit higher. And genetic counseling is, is vitally important in the diagnosis of a patient with NF1 as well as their care. Uh, people need to understand that NF1 is an autosomal dominant disorder and in fact is one of the most common domin dominantly inherited disorders with an incidence of about 1 in 3,000. About half of patients with neurofibromatosis ha uh, have so as a result of a new mutation, but that means about half of them will have an affected parent. Uh, and interestingly enough, because this disorder tends to be relatively mild, some parents may not be aware of their diagnosis of NF1, particularly if it's a large family with many patients with NF1. These patients may not be aware that, that, uh, that their cafe au laits and small neurofibromas are abnormal. And if a parent is, uh, is affected, the risk to, to any siblings for your patient is, is 50%. But if a parent is unaffected, the risk to siblings is, is quite low, but is higher than the general population uh, because we know that there's a possibility of what we call germline mosaicism meaning that either, if either one of the parents may have a, a, a small change in the NF1 gene in one of their gonads, which may predispose to having other children with the same condition, even though the parents themselves are clinically well. So thank you for your attention. I hope you uh, got some benefit from learning a little about the diagnosis and management of neurofibromatosis type 1.